Good morning. Welcome to Epiphany Station. My name's Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station, and I'm glad to see all of you, and I'm glad to be up here um, again after three months. It's been a long time. See if I remember how to do this. But, man, it's, it's just great. You know, I got to tell you guys, honestly, uh, this past summer, we visited six different churches over the course of the summer, and the uh, two best messages I heard all summer we're right here at Epiphany Station with Maddie and Millie. And so, and I'm not, I'm not lying. That's the truth. The best worship experience we had all summer was, was the two times we came here during the summer with Wyatt and his team. And I know I'm perhaps a little biased, but I just absolutely love our church. And I, I hope my wife loves our church too. But man, we are just so blessed to have such gifted young leaders amongst us um, who have a clear sense of calling on their lives. And I think, you know, nothing nothing made me prouder than this summer to see these people just just rise to the top and take ownership. Um, I mean, this has been the most difficult season I think we've had as a church over the course of this past year. And so just to, why do I keep cutting in and out? Okay, I don't sound good to me, so I hope it sounds good to you. But this was the most difficult season I think we've had in the life of our church. And, and just young people just stood up and took ownership and took leadership of our church. And it is such a blessing for us. And it's extremely rare. And I hope that doesn't get lost on us. I hope that that we can realize just how special this is and what a tremendous blessing it is and how faithful God has been to us as his church to continue to guide us and provide for us through every situation and every circumstance that we faced as a church. It's a true blessing, and it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. This past summer, um, my family was honored and privileged and blessed by you guys giving us three months off to do exactly what we're talking about now, which is to reset, an opportunity to reset our priorities, to reset our productivity, to reset our purpose. Because let's face it, it's just too easy to get caught up in the daily grind. You just get going and going and going, and you fall victim to the tyranny of the urgent You always are just reacting instead of initiating. And like a hamster on that wheel, it just keeps spinning around and round and round and round and round. Or like a treadmill that just keeps going faster and faster and faster and faster. And you can't slow down. You can't get off. You've got to keep pace in the rat race. Or somebody's going to run you over. You're going to fall off. You're going to fall down. It's going to be ugly. So periodically, we have to press that reset button. We have to hit reset to kind of remind ourselves, okay, what am I doing here? We need to reset our priorities, which is what Maddie talked about last week, to remember what it is that's really important and put those first things first again. We need to reset our purpose to be reminded why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing, what we should be doing. And we have to reset our productivity to get an idea of what work, the role that work plays in our lives. But let's face it, that treadmill isn't going to stop on its own. Nobody's going to stop it for you. You have to be the one to press the reset button. You have to take the initiative to reset your purpose, your priorities, and your productivity. So let me ask you a question as we get started here today. What is your least favorite day of the week? Come on. Monday or Monday. Monday. I'm so glad that none of you said Sunday. (laughs) Monday is hands down people's least favorite day of the week. According to to research, 50% of workers show up late to work on Monday. 50%. Isn't that crazy? Productivity of the average worker is less than 30% on Mondays. 
That's why they should just give us Monday off. We're not doing anything anyway. Just give it off. Here's an interesting one. Studies show that most people don't even smile until 11.16 a.m. on Mondays. So if you want to totally mess with somebody tomorrow, just walk in smiling. Totally will rock their world. On a more serious note, heart attacks increase by 20% on Mondays. And more suicides occur on Mondays than any other day of the week. Why is that? Unfortunately, for for most of us, we're going to spend the majority of our waking hours at work. We will spend more hours at work than we will at home. We will spend more time with our coworkers than we will with our family. We will spend more time working than almost anything else in life, than sleeping, than resting, than eating or playing or doing the other things that we want to do. So if you have a job that you hate or coworkers that you can't stand, it's going to make for a pretty miserable moan day, right? It can make for a pretty miserable life if something doesn't change. But what if something could change? What if you could reset your view of work? What if you could press that reset button and change how you viewed your job? Are you ready to reset your mind for the daily grind? Because that's what we're going to do here today. In your program, there's an outline, pretty extensive outline, actually. And we're going to talk about three areas that we need to press that reset button and then three ways that we can really put that into action. So the first place that we need to hit that reset button is from job to stewardship. From job to stewardship. Stewardship's kind of a a big word that it just really means taking care of stuff for somebody else. To to be a manager or a trustee of someone else's affairs. So from job to stewardship. Now see, this idea of work goes all the way back to the very, very beginning. To the beginning of the story of God. The first book in the Bible, the very first verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many people here have created something? We've got a bunch of non-creative types. Okay. <laughs> Here's the answer. You have all created something. If you have a child, you have created something. Okay? If you have ever hammered a nail, you have created something. If you've ever made a piece of of art, you have created something. If you've ever devised a plan, you have created something. And those of us who have created something, we know that to create something takes work. It takes effort. And we oftentimes think of God, we know he's God the creator, but we don't really think of God as a worker. Yet this is the first way that God reveals himself to us in history is as a worker. We go to the next chapter of Genesis. It says, on the seventh day, God finished his work of creation, so he rested from all of his work. God rested from his work, but he didn't rest like permanently. He rested and then he got back to work because God is still at work. He is still at work in the creation of every mountain, every tree, every plant, every animal, every human being. We are God's greatest work. In the first creation of humans, back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Since we are created in the image of God who is a worker, then it stands to reason that we are created to work because we're in his image. And God gave his created beings work to do. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. God placed, planted the garden and Adam cultivated it. 
And this is a divine partnership that exists to this day. God creates and we manage what God has created. We take care of it. Therefore, our work is not just a job. It is stewardship. It is caring for God's creation. Now, if you have a hard time thinking about this, like say you're packaging parts at at DigiKey or uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's or something, you're wondering, how can this be stewardship? Think about the people that you are serving. The people that you are serving are God's highest priority, God's highest created beings. And think about how you are being a steward by caring for those people, by giving them what they need or what they want. You are a steward. The second reset button we need to push is from bad to good. From bad to good. Tragically, with the entrance of sin into the human race, this idea of stewardship became distorted because of this sin, and this partnership was distorted. Adam and Eve then, and human beings, became self-centered instead of focusing on God. They had created a desire to to take instead of to give, to be served instead of to serve, to hate instead of to love. And now because of sin, there are really two primary lies that we believe about work. Here's the first lie that we believe. We believe that you are what you do. This is especially true for men. We believe this lie that we are what we do. Think about it. If a man meets another man for the first time, what's the first thing he asks him? So, uh, what do you do? We don't care if you have a wife or have kids. We don't want to see pictures of your family. We We don't care where you live or where you have lived or how those things have shaped your life. It doesn't matter. We don't even care what your name is. Why? Because that's not your identity. Your identity is what you do. You are what you do. That's what we care about. Sadly, this leads many men to become workaholics and many of their wives to hate their work because they're always giving their time and their energy to work. But think about it. If you are defined by what you do, why wouldn't you want to do that all the time? If you're defined by your work, then you better do it well and you better do it a lot because you don't want to let yourself or other people down because people are going to judge you and you judge yourself by how much money you make, how successful you are, how productive you are, how many people or projects you manage. Those are the measuring sticks that men use to judge each other. And if you get your identity from that, why would you want to do anything other than work? We believe that we are, or what we do is who we are. And men, that's a lie. That's a lie. The truth is your identity is not found in what you do. Your identity is found in who you are. Listen to what God says about your identity. Romans 8, 15. So if you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves, instead you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. Abba was an Aramaic word. It doesn't get translated because it doesn't really have an English equivalent, but it's somewhere along the lines of daddy. It's a term of endearment, an affectionate name for a father. And that's who we have. Men, you are not a slave to the grind. You are not a slave to other people's expectations of you. You are not a slave to what other people think of you. You are not a slave to your past or to your present. You are a son of God, and that is your identity. Whether you are a minister or a mechanic or a manager or a meat packer, I don't know, whatever it is, that's not your identity. Your identity is as a son of God. That's the truth, and that's who you are. The second lie that we believe about work is that work is a necessary evil. It's true that because of sin, work became hard. 
And because it's hard, many of us think, oh, I hate going to work on Monday. In Genesis chapter 3, the consequence of sin. God tells Adam, since you listened to your wife, first mistake, <laughs> you ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you'll struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. And all the farmers are going, yep, I understand that. But it's not just farmers. If you are a hard worker, then work is going to be hard. That's a promise. Work will wear you down and it will wear you out. That's a guarantee. That's what, what God says. But just because work is hard doesn't mean that it's bad. Work was given to, to Adam before the fall. It was given to as part of creation. And God, everything that God created, he said, is good. And so, yes, even work is created good. Though because of sin, it's become hard. Maybe not as pleasurable as God intended it to be, but it is still good. Work is not a necessary evil. It is a necessary good for bringing about God's redemptive plan for humanity in our world. So reset from bad to good. The third reset we need to make is from work to worship. From work to worship. The Apostle Paul writing in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. He's addressing slaves here. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all of your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or free. So masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. So here the Apostle Paul is addressing the people that had the hardest job of all, slaves. People that didn't get to choose where they were going to work. It was chosen for them, and they didn't get paid a whole lot for it. And he tells these people with the most difficult jobs and the most difficult situations to do their absolute best to work respectively, wholeheartedly, and enthusiastically for everyone at all times. Why? Because when you do so, you are not just working for your boss. You are working for Christ. So even if you don't like your boss, even if you think your boss is a complete idiot, even if your boss is a jerk, if you do your best, you are not just pleasing that boss, you are actually pleasing Christ. And this, God tells us, is his will. You're working for God, not for people. Work is a gift from God to be given back to God to glorify him. And you know what we call that? Worship. Worship. Our work is an act of worship to give to God, to glorify Him. God is a worker, and He created us to be workers. Work is good, and when we do what God created us to do, then what we do is our worship. So let me give you three things for us to work on then to become more worshipful in our work. Back to the Apostle Paul. Some of us may know him as like a great missionary, someone who wrote a lot of the New Testament of the Bible. But the thing that's really unique about the Apostle Paul is that he never demanded or raised support from anybody else, but he always worked to provide for himself, and not just for himself, but for those who were with him. Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 20. Acts is a great book in the New Testament. It kind of tells the story of the church from the time of Jesus through the next 50 years and how the church uh, really grew and exploded in the area. And towards the end of this book, 
Paul says, I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked hard to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So the first thing that we need to work at to make our work more worshipful is to work at being content. Paul says, I have never coveted anyone else's silver or gold or fine clothes. To covet means to desire to possess what another person has. We can covet uh, somebody else's job. We can covet their car, their house, their, their spouse. We can covet their attitude. We can covet anything that anybody else has, and it's a sin. There was a Facebook study that was done a couple years ago that revealed that the more people use Facebook, the less content they are. Why? Why? Because you see other people's lives and what they have, and suddenly your life doesn't look so good, and you start to covet their life or their possessions. There's a book uh, about 20 years ago called The Day America Told the Truth. And in that book, the, the, review, the authors revealed some shocking statistics about how far people are willing to go for $10 million. Actually, it's not all that shocking. But when people were asked what they would do if they were guaranteed $10 million, 25% of people said that they would abandon their family for $10 million. Another 25% said that they would abandon their faith. 23% said that they would become prostitutes for a week or more for $10 million. 16% said they would give up their U.S. citizenship. And 7% said that they would kill a stranger for $10 million. Here's what God says about this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is the Apostle Paul again. It says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Contentment is not having everything you want. Contentment is wanting everything that you have. Contentment is not having everything you want. It is wanting everything that you have. G.K. Chesterton, who was a, a British author, Around about 100 years ago, World War I, World War II era, contemporary of C.S. Lewis, he said that there are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more. The other is to desire less. You can accumulate more or you can desire less. Work at being content because if your work is your worship, that should always be enough. Second thing we need to work at is being generous. Work at being generous. So in the second half of, of that, what Paul says in Acts, he says, you know that these hands of mine have worked hard to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus of more blessed to give than receive. See, we don't work just to care for our own needs. We work to care for the needs of others as well. Working just to have is an American ideal. It is not a godly ideal. That is not what God created us for. 
We usually think in terms of we work hard so that we will be able to take care of ourselves, take care of our children and our grandchildren. We'll be able to give them nice things, be able to go on nice vacations, have a nice retirement, have that, get that bigger house or that nicer car or that boat or, or whatever we want. And, and that's why we work hard. But that's not the reason why we work hard according to Scripture. The reason why we work hard is so that we can provide for our own needs, but also for the needs of others. God is calling us to reset our mind for the daily grind, to think about, reset our mind as to why we do what we do, why we work hard. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to view your job radically different than the American ideal. You need to reset your mind to think about it biblically, to work with a view towards meeting the needs of others. When you punch that clock, when you go to work every day, you have to have a bigger view in mind. You're not going just to provide for yourself. You're going so that you can bless others. Bless others with your work and also to bless others with your paycheck. There's an anonymous quote from somebody it says we make a living. It's good, huh? Somewhere. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Work at being generous. Because if your work is your worship, you will always have enough. Third thing then for us to work at is being excellent. Work at being excellent at your job. There's at least two reasons, good reasons, why you should be good at what you do. The first one is that when we do what we are created to do with excellence, it brings God glory. It is truly an act of worship. God created you for a purpose, and he placed you in your job for a purpose. And when you do that with all that he has given you, it glorifies your maker, and it is an act of worship. So whether you are a burger flipper or a toilet washer or a construction worker or a parts assembler or a manager or a supervisor or a VP or whatever you are, do it with excellence and you will glorify your maker. The second reason for us to be excellent in what we do is when we work with excellence, it gives us an audience and an opportunity to influence influential people. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Asks, do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. The Bible is full of examples of people like Joseph, Nehemiah, Daniel, among many others who were excellent at what they did. Even though their people were in captivity and they were enslaved in this foreign land, these people worked with excellence for the kings that they served. And because they did their jobs well, they had a platform to influence influential people. And God used that to further influence his purposes and his plans and change the course of history because some men were, were committed to being excellent in what they did. Here's the simple truth. You will never have any influence if you suck at your job. Right? Right? Nobody's going to listen to you if you suck at what you do. So be excellent in what you do. Many of you go places daily that I could never go. You rub shoulders daily with people that, that will never set foot in church, people that I will never have an audience with. So no matter what your job is, you have a unique opportunity to share the love of Christ each and every day with the people you work with, the people you work for, the whoever your customers are. You have a unique opportunity. God has put you in that place to glorify him. Daily you stand at the intersection between faith and life, between work 
in church. Be excellent in what you do and thus show people the love of Christ. Heidi and I are getting ready to go to our 20th college reunion here in a, a few weeks, if you can believe it. Yeah, I'm so thankful for my education. I went to Bethel College down in the cities. And what I'm going to share with you now, I learned my very first semester there when I was 18 years old in a class called Foundations of Ministry. And in that class, our professor, we talked about work, this very idea of work. And it was in that class that I learned what the word vocation means. The word vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, which means calling. And so I remember my professor, I remember it's been 24 years now, and I remember it to this day. It has shaped my life and my view of work because he said, for the follower of Jesus Christ, there are many occupations, but there's only one vocation, to love God and to love people wherever you are, whatever you do. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what your job is. God places different people in different places and gifts them and gives them passions for different things. But no matter where you are, no matter what you do, you have one calling as a follower of Jesus Christ, and that is to love God with all that you are and to love people with all that you've got, no matter what your job is. Your work is no less a ministry than mine. And my work is no more worship than yours. God has gifted us all differently. If you want to find worth in your work, then view your work as a calling. This is something that God has called me to. A calling involves recognizing that we are co-workers with Christ that we are partnering with God to be stewards of what he's given us, stewards of his creation. And we can accomplish his purposes by being content, by being generous and being excellent in all that we do. So if you're struggling to face another Monday tomorrow, not sure how you're going to do it, remember that God is a worker. And God's greatest work is done inside of you. So ask, pray to God the worker and ask him to reset your mind for the daily grind. And let your work be your worship. Let's pray. God, I pray for everybody here. So many different people, so many different jobs. All these different occupations, but you've given us all one vocation. So God, I pray for everybody here that you would empower them through your spirit to do the work that you have given them with excellence. God, that you would just bless their work, bless them in their work. God, and that they would, you would just renew their minds if they are struggling. God, and you would just give them a clear sense of calling in whatever their job is. For your glory we pray.